G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dingle DIY and in this episode I'm going to be going over how I made my battery box. Now I just want to apologise up front for any lack of continuity. I filmed a lot of these clips before, I, a couple days before I went on holiday and now that I'm back I realise I skipped over a few things and now that I've rewatched the footage uh, I'm just going to add in a few things as we need just to fully explain what I've done and what I've made with this battery box. Now this video is long enough without me explaining how to do wiring. I've made a separate tutorial on 12 volt wiring and I go over crimp connections, spade terminals, pinning in plugs, wiring up Anderson plugs, ring terminals, battery isolators, soldering. I'll show you all of that in a separate video in good detail. So if you want to learn how to do all these wiring connections, that's where you'll be able to learn how to do it. To run you through it, we've got our cables from our starter battery which can plug in to our isolator and then the isolator bolts to the battery. Now from there we can bolt all of our power out and power in. So we can bolt that wire to the battery and then plug it into either the solar panel or a 240 volt charger. The power coming in is protected in the regulator and in the charger itself. But the power going out needs protection which is what that fuse is for. It runs to our switch, uh, and then that runs to these three points. We've got a voltmeter, USB, and SIG socket. And our last harness has also got a fuse on it, but it has no inline switch, because the switch is on the front of the inverter. And that's gonna give us our 240 volt. Now this battery represents the battery we would have in the car. And there's a fuse right here. So that means this section of the harness is protected. We've got an Anderson plug on that. That plugs into here. And the beauty of this is, all we have to do is unplug it here and all of this can go into a different car. And the only thing we have to do to any car to make this work is run two cables and a fuse. So it is nighttime now. Tomorrow I will need it all up. I'm making some modifications to the battery box. This here is a DC to DC charger. The most typical application of this is in cars with smart alternators. Now this will work instead of a battery isolator as well and it's got a whole bunch of protection built into it. Now I've also wired in a battery monitor with a screen. So that's going to tell me more than just voltage. It's going to tell me what I'm using, temperature, all kinds of good stuff. So I'll show you how that wires in. It's pretty simple. This is pretty simple as well. You just give it a small power wire so that the this, this unit knows that the car is on and then this will turn on and it'll start doing its job. Uh, and then you've got power in from your starter battery and then power out to your secondary battery. And that's pretty much it. Uh, this gives you a lot of flexibility and it's gonna give you the most life out of your secondary battery. So it's a good thing to have, especially in a modern car with a smart alternator. Alright, let's talk about why smart alternators don't work with battery isolators like this. Now to understand what's going on, you need to know that a smart alternator has a variable voltage output. The variable voltage alternator or the smart alternator is going to change how much voltage it sends to that start battery. You can see voltages of anywhere between 14 down to as low as 10 volts uh, and that's going to wreak havoc on a battery isolator like this. The smart alternator does this because it reduces uh, fuel emissions and it reduces the load on the engine, so that's a good thing. It just makes it tricky for adding a secondary battery. Now this battery isolator only has a range where it comes into action at 13.3 uh, and then it'll break the link between the two batteries at 12.8. So let's decipher what that means. Now your secondary battery isn't the main priority because you always want to start your car. So you need to make sure your starter battery is charged and that's what this is making sure of. This isn't gonna send power to your second battery until your first battery reaches 13.3 volts or whatever it says it's gonna do. In my case, 13.3 volts. 
So that means the alternator is going to charge the start battery, it's going to get it up to 13.3, the isolator is going to kick into action, and then it's going to connect the link between the two batteries and send the power from the alternator that's coming into the first battery, it's going to send that on to the second battery, and they're both going to charge, and it's happy days. Now when you're drawing power out of your second battery and they're both connected, they're going to stay connected until this battery isolator sees a voltage at 12.8 or lower, and then it's going to break that connection. So your batteries will be fully charged above 12.8, your fridge might be on drawing power out of your second battery and your start battery, and then as soon as it gets to 12.8 or lower, the connection is broken, your start battery stays at 12.8, and your secondary battery will continue powering your fridge, and then you can be sure the next day your start battery is going to be charged enough to start the car. So that works great on ordinary cars, but not so much with a smart alternator. Now because a smart alternator is operating in a range between 14 and 10 volts usually, it might not tell this isolator to connect the two batteries together. So to translate that, your alternator might be operating at 12.5 volts and that will charge your start battery because they're directly connected, but because you've got an isolator in the way of your second battery and your start battery, and your alternator is only running at 12.5, for example, this isolator is never going to see 13.3 volts, and it's never going to connect those two batteries together, and your second battery is never going to get charged with your smart alternator when it's running at 12.5, for example, or anything lower than 13.3 volts in my case. So that's why I've got a DC to DC charger. That'll pick up any voltage between 10 and 14, send it to the second battery, and charge that second battery at the specific amount that battery needs to be charged at. So let's say the second battery needs to be charged at 14 volts and we're only getting 12.5 from the smart alternator. The DC to DC charger will boost that up, send that 14 volts into the secondary battery even though it's only seeing 12.5 from the alternator. Now not only does it do this, it acts as a battery isolator. It will separate the two batteries when you turn your car off and it will also be good for charging various chemistries of different batteries such as lithium ion or lead acid depending on what you have. Alright, this DC to DC charger is mainly powered from the battery, but in order to tell it to turn on we need the signal wire, uh, and in order to keep this battery box uh, modular and, you know, we don't want to hardwire this into the car, we do want to be able to plug it in. So I've got this plug here, uh, and then I've got this fuse kind of adapter that'll plug into an existing fuse. Uh, and then we put two fuses in here, one for the existing fuse uh, that this takes place of, and then another fuse for this trigger wire circuit. Now, it's already pre-crimped on one end, we just got to chuck a wire in, crimp it down, and the job's done. Alright, so I've got a test light here. Now you just connect that to earth, it's got an alligator clip on it. Now this just has a light in it, and when it sees power, it'll illuminate. So I've got it on this fuse and it's not illuminating, so we'll turn the car on. And now that illuminates. And if I put the keys in accessory, it won't illuminate. So that means we can use this fuse to power our DC to DC charger. All right, I'm just in the engine bay here, and this is the fuse panel, and underneath there are some spare fuses a diagram and some tweezers. Now I'm just going to use these tweezers to rip out the fuse. Now we've got these big chunky wires in here. They bolt directly to the terminal uh, and then they run through the engine bay, through the firewall. Alright, I've just switched the GoPro so I can actually fit the camera in, but I've followed the factory wiring through the factory grommet. So those wires come in through that grommet from the engine bay into the car. Now you can just pull the glove box out, and that'll give you access in there. And now these just run down the interior trim, along here, and they pop out under the seat. And what we have here is our Anderson plug that connects into our battery box. Now this here is just a signal wire for the DC to DC charger, which I ran to the same spot. But to get that signal, I piggybacked it off a fuse uh, on the driver's side. Now originally I had an inline fuse here, and when we were on the road, 
Uh, I kept blowing fuses. I think it was just a poor quality fuse holder. So the only thing available to me was a circuit breaker instead, and that's automatically resetting. So I wired in a circuit breaker here, which is important to say. All right, here's the end result. It's a bit bruised and battered because I have already taken it on holiday, but it does work. Up the front, I've mounted the SIG socket, voltmeter, and USB port. These turn on with this switch. Uh, and this is where I plug the fridge into. Now this voltmeter is a very basic way of monitoring your battery. Anything above 13 volts means your battery is full. 12.0 uh, volts mean your battery is half full. Uh, and at that point you should immediately charge it. Anything lower than 50% you should expect damage to be done to your battery. Uh, and about 10 volts is 0%, so that means you've definitely done some damage uh, and your battery won't hold as much charge ever again, basically. So it's good practice to keep your batteries topped up uh, 80% or higher uh, and never ever below 50%. Okay, on the back side, we've got a secondary output. That is for the inverter. And charger input is for a trickle charger or a solar input. Now on top, I've got a battery monitor. Now you basically input the specs of your battery, amp hours, things like that, volts, uh, and then this will monitor what percent your battery is at and how many amp hours you've got left. And it also set an alarm to warn you when your battery is getting critically low. Now I just mounted this with some Velcro because the cable is actually very long, which means you could pull it out about four meters and mount that with some more Velcro, maybe up the front. If you've got this in the boot of your car, maybe it's in a caravan, you can still monitor your battery remotely. Uh, and because it's Velcroed on, it means I've got access to the back of it. I can unplug it and take the lid off uh, and monitor things inside in case I blow a fuse or need to do some maintenance. Okay, so sitting on top is our DC to DC charger. This is everything bolted up to the battery. Now we've got our inline fuses. We've got our battery monitor. Now. You see this wire here, which I said earlier was four meters long, connects to our screen. This is how it finds out all that information. It's got a positive cable from the battery, and then every negative terminal of everything in here connects to one side of the battery monitor, and then the battery monitor connects to the battery. This is how the instructions tell you to do it, uh, and basically it just monitors everything that's not only getting drawn from the battery, but everything that's charging it as well. Now these holes on the front, up the top are for ventilation. These switches on the charger control the output of the charger depending on what battery you have. So read the instructions that come with your charger and match it up to the type of battery that you have. Now this signal wire is what turns the charger on. We've already been over that. Uh, and I've just looped this in. So if you give this right hand side of the terminal power, it'll limit the charger to 50%. So instead of a 40 amp, it's actually a 20 amp because 20 amps was all I needed. I basically just hijacked the power out of the signal wire anyway. There's no need to run two cables when that works just the same. All right, I'll just give you a quick demonstration of what the battery box is capable of all at once. Now you can hear the fan running. That just plugs into the SIG socket. Uh, we've got a USB port, so that's charging some GoPro batteries. Here's our battery monitor. That's telling us what's happening. Now those down arrows indicate that we are discharging. If they were facing up, it would mean we are charging. Now we come to these Anderson plugs. This is how the inverter connects. I got a bigger inverter uh, and that'll handle some pretty serious appliances. And that's charging power tool batteries, which have a typical household plug on them. The other Anderson plug is charging input, which is our solar panel. And this came with its own regulator, and that says there we're producing about 12.8 volts, which has its own extension lead. Alternatively, we could plug in the trickle charger, which plugs in to a wall, depending on where you are and if the sun's shining or not. Now, the beauty of Anderson plugs is I can chop and change all of these things. So I can use the extension lead. It just opens up a lot more possibilities. And so the last thing that's left would be to put this in the car and plug it to the start battery 
and the trigger wire. Now the benefit of having your secondary battery in a battery box means you can pull it out of your car. I didn't want the secondary battery permanently in the Honda because I've got a Hilux which I take four wheel driving. So depending on what car I want to use and what I'm doing, I can put this battery box in either car. I can put the fridge in either car and I'm not going to worry about either of them not starting the next day. Now all I need to do in both of those cars is run the two main power wires, one from the positive, one from the negative of the start battery, run those into the area where I'll be keeping the battery box uh, and then run a trigger wire for the DC to DC charger. Now the great thing about that is it doesn't matter what alternator I have, what car I'm using it in, the DC to DC charger is going to make sure the secondary battery is going to be charged properly. Now if you're wondering why I've built my own battery box instead of just buying a pre-made one, for starters I got to select what battery I wanted and I wasn't limited by the battery box and the sizes they come in. And I already had a few things laying around. I already had the uh, battery isolator, which I didn't end up using anyway, but that was part of the reason for me making my own because if I had bought a battery box, I would have been doubling up and wasting money on things that I already had. Now the battery box doesn't always include everything and obviously you don't get to build it how you like. And I'm pretty stoked with how it looks now that it's in an esky. Uh, I didn't need the esky because I've got a fridge now and I still got a couple spares anyway. So I thought that'd be a cool little way to build a battery box and that's why I decided to make my own. Now this video is long enough without me explaining how to do wiring. I've made a separate tutorial on 12 volt wiring. So if you want to learn how to do all these wiring connections, that's where you'll be able to learn how to do it. But as I said, this video is long enough without all of that in there. So I've just shown you what I've made and how it all connects together and just explained a bit of the technology that's going on inside the battery box and my reasons for making it a battery box and not permanently mounting it in the car. All right, thanks for watching guys. Uh, if you like this video, make sure you subscribe. There'll be plenty more coming. Now I'll link the 12 volt wiring tutorial. Uh, you can head over there and learn how all this goes together. And other than that, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.